Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome to this new tutorial series in which I'm going to walk you through writing a song. This project here is a finished song that I wrote in its entirety in Cubase and I made a tutorial series documenting the, the writing of this song. I'll put a link somewhere. But this is what we're going to get to. Now, if you're fairly new to Cubase, this is completely overwhelming. I wouldn't expect you to understand anything about what's going on here. It's way too much and it's really difficult to actually break down to show you how to get to this stage. So I figured a much better way to do it is throw everything away, start from a completely empty brand new application and write a song from scratch. And as we do, I'm going to show you all of the features of Cubase in the context of the composition of a real world piece of music. So we'll learn all of this stuff in a genuinely real world context. So the first thing that we're going to do is throw this song away. And you saw me click open hub there. I can't actually speak when the, the interface isn't open because of the way that we've got the audio set up. And um, we'll go through all of that much later. So here we are in our Steinberg hub. You should see this when you first install your application and this is how I recommend you work. You'll generally tend to find there's like 34 different ways to do anything in Cubase. I'm just going to show you the way that I do it because I think it's the best. And if you want to investigate your other options, that's absolutely fine. But this is how I um, manage projects using the hub. And we're gonna select prompt for project location in this little box at the bottom, which means we remain in complete control of the entire process. Now, what that means is that when we click this big happy create and um, empty button, we're going to get our list of projects. So I've created a folder in my documents directory called Cubase projects, and I've created an empty folder called project one. Now you can see completely empty. So open it, get to this stage, and say select folder, and then you'll get your project setup box. Most of this stuff is default and I've never touched it. The, the things that you will be interested in is uh, your display format. Let's set it to bars and beats for now. And your um, record file format. This is a fairly important decision. And once you make it, I kind of recommend that you stick with it because if you change between projects and you're changing um, these sample rates and bit depths. You can have issues like moving audio from one application to another if there are different sample rates. I just make a decision and stick with it. Now, years ago, I decided to stick with 44.124 bit. I can't tell any difference between 44 and 48 kilohertz. I mean, no human being can. This is all very advanced stuff about anti-aliasing effects and stuff that we might get on to talk about later. But these are my settings and they're absolutely fine. Again, I haven't changed any of these. All of that is completely default. Let's just click OK. So here we are in an empty project. Now, your version of Cubase won't look exactly like this, but by the time we've finished, it could, because I'm going to show you everything about how I configure my application, including all of the window sizes and preferences. So we'll get to all of that later. But there's only so many things we can do in any one session. And today, I want to concentrate on studio setup. So this is configuring our audio device to talk to Cubase, pretty important. Much more important than what color our background screen is. So here we've got our ASIO driver. This is your primary interface between your, your hardware, your audio hardware and Cubase. Select whatever your ASIO driver is for your um, audio interface of choice. If you don't have an ASIO interface, go and get one, you need it. And you can see my um, my latency is at about six and a half milliseconds. That's pretty much where I like to keep it. Five, six, seven milliseconds is absolutely fine. Completely unnoticeable. I change my other system settings in order to get to this stage. So it's gonna depend on what kind of computer you've got. I've got a fairly meaty um, processor in there. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's it's pretty fast. Um, but it is just a tower PC, you know, I don't have a massive server room. This is my office at home and I'm just running all of this off Windows 10. Let's have a look at some of these other settings. Um, I've just noticed I was messing around before that should be set to normal. Uh, audio priority normal is if you're using MIDI and audio together and 
I do. So typically let's have that set to normal. If you're only processing audio, then you can set it to boost, but I don't think there's ever a need to really. Processing precision um, at 64 bit just make allows Cubase to produce slightly more accurate audio because it's, it's using more slices every time it's processing audio. VST instruments typically operate at 64 bits these days anyway, and I've not been able to come across any mention of dramatic overhead um, by switching to 64 bits. So I think it's 32 bit by default, but 64 bits should be fine. Never untick this box. This um, forces your CPU to use a single um, thread. You really don't want that. Have activate multiprocessing on all the time. And ASIO guard is also really important. This means that for stuff that's already been recorded or is basically in the background, tracks that haven't been record armed and aren't being recorded or monitored um, directly, Cubase uses a second buffer system basically to kind of preload this stuff into memory to take away the burden of having to process audio in real time. So it's a great feature. You should have it on all the time. I have it set to normal and you can see that generates a 23 milliseconds lag in playback only. I can't, it's really important to, between me pressing like go and then um, the, the song actually starting, there's a 23 millisecond lag, utterly unnoticeable. If you set to high, um, my latency goes up to about 97 and at that point, if you're moving faders on your computer or some other kind of automated process, you can just about notice that there's this little bit of lag. So I operate normal and I've never had any um, co uh, bad consequence from it. So that's what I recommend you do. Activate uh, the audio power scheme basically prevents your computer from doing any kind of falling asleep. It just keeps it active all the time. So there is a higher power demand, but if you're prepared to pay those extra few pennies, then I don't see any reason to turn that off. I've never set uh, disk preload to anything other than three seconds. And this option down below is kind of important. This is purely my choice. Because I have this six and a half milliseconds of latency, I actually give my computer um, an 11 millisecond head start when recording stuff. So if I'm re like recording the guitar, 500 samples at 44.1 kilohertz is about 11 milliseconds. So whatever I hit on the guitar basically gets moved forwards 11 milliseconds in time and recorded at that point in the song. I don't lose 11 milliseconds of sound off the beginning or end. There's no like, you know, end of days scenario here. It just auto adjusts the track by about the amount that I've empirically determined I kind of need to do anyway when I record stuff. So if I've recorded something um, and my, my timing is pretty good and I'm really quite confident that I was, I was, I was nailing it, ordinarily, if you look, the, there would be generally on average about a seven millisecond lag because of this. So I just knock it forwards a little bit. Just I gave myself a little bit more headroom. So that's completely up to you. You don't have to adjust for record, uh, for record latency. It just means that if you're recording live with like stuff on your, um, on your audio channels, um, plugins, effect plugins or whatnot, all of that is going to introduce a little bit of latency. And so everything that you record is going to be very slightly behind time and you'll have to move it forward slightly. And this just accounts for that. But that number is heavily empirically derived. I spent about an hour, you know, doing loads and loads of testing and came to the conclusion that that was the number I wanted. Now let's have a look over at the um, audio device itself. And if we go into control panel, this is a really important number here, buffer size. This is how you determine what your latency is gonna be. If I make this buffer size much smaller, my computer is gonna to have to work much harder because it's got very little, it's got a very small window of opportunity to get all of the processing done in real time as I'm playing my guitar or my bass or whatever. You put, you're really pushing your computer and I've decided that 128 is the buffer size of choice for me. 
I don't get any audio dropouts. If I'm using VSTs that are really hungry, the stuff that you can do to mitigate those problems, we're going to deal with all of this over the course of this series. Now, going into the details of all the various setups for the inputs and outputs is beyond the scope of this video. That's quite a, a weighty subject in its own right. For the most part, you're going to get um, connections between your first two inputs. Inputs one and two, all audio devices are going to have them. They're going to be routed directly into Cubase and by default it's going to be set up. I've got an unusual setup because I need to record into OBS and I've got pecu peculiarities about my setup that actually in means that uh, inputs one and two are inactive in Cubase for me, but they won't be for you. Similarly, you might not have eight outputs, you might only have two, it really doesn't matter. As long as you're getting stuff from your audio device into Cubase and back, then we're all going to be happy. And that's our fundamental setup sorted. Now, every single one of those features that we talked about today has a potential rabbit hole down which we can dive and there's tons of stuff to talk about. But of course, we want to take baby steps and we want to get to the point where we can write music as fast as we possibly can. So all of those things that I drew your attention to today, yes, they're all important. But if you just basically copy as many of those defaults as you possibly can and get yourself to the point where you're working, where you're up and running and you can record some music, you can always go back and, and tweak those settings later if you understand what they mean. And so what we're going to do to end today is we're going to create a single instrument track and it's going to be a drum track and I'm going to choose Groove Agent and I've done a very long tutorial series on how to use Groove Agent. I'll put a link for you, but um, that's a, a mighty subject in its own right. But for today, I simply want it to make some sound to prove that we're up and running. So I've just created an instrument track. This is an instance of my drum machine of choice and we can have a look at it and we can load a drum set in here and I can click a pad and I've just discovered that that is way too loud so I'll turn the volume down that's a bit more sensible there we go so we're up and running we have a working musical instrument at our disposal and then in the next video we'll have a bit more of a chat about instrument tracks and try to figure out how to do something useful with this instance of Groove Agent. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit the like button. I uh, really appreciate it. And I've got some Patreon and YouTube membership details somewhere. Have a look at them. See you next time. Thanks very much.